anytime we have hierarchy, people can feel that. We might not think that they can, and we might not be trying to do that, but people can feel that. And if we truly recognize the beloved in each person, then each person has something to teach us and we might have something to give them. My name is Alex Lewis, and you're listening to Words Matter, a podcast by Car Window Poetry. Every other Thursday, we invite you to hear from someone who's using words to make the world a better place. Today, I'm chatting with Brandy Lee. She is the co-founder of Beauty for Ashes Uganda, a nonprofit that works towards long-term sustainable development for single moms and widows in Uganda. I'm really excited for you to hear Brandy's story. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Here's my conversation with Brandy Lee. All right. I am here with my friend, Brandy Lee. Brandy, welcome to the show. Hey, I'm so glad that I get to be here. This is so exciting. Yes. And Brandy, it's actually funny that we're recording this via video chat or whatever right now, because we literally live like five minutes away from each other. (laughs) Yeah, we could have done this in person. (laughs) (laughs) If If I knew the technology behind it, we would have been drinking, right. <laughs> having a great time. But Brandy, I'm super, super grateful to have you on the show. And for me, I've gotten to um, spend a significant amount of time with you. But there are folks who this may be their first time getting to hear your story and the heart behind the different things that you're doing. And so, Brandy, who are you? <laughs> well, isn't that a big question? <laughs> I feel like when we ask that so often, it means what do we do? Yeah. But I think your question is deeper than that. Yeah. Um, so I'll give you what like a bio would say, which is that I am Brandy Lee. I'm a single mama to three middle schoolers, which means I'm way older than I actually think I am. <laughs> uh, so grateful to have men like you, Alex, pouring into my kiddos. And I also get the honor and the privilege of founding and leading the executive director of Beauty for Ashes Worldwide. And so because I'm the founder of Beauty for Ashes Worldwide, I feel like their mission statement really is my life mission statement. Mm. And so it is kind of a description of who I am, not just what I do, because I feel like the work that I do is an extension of my soul. Mm. not my job. And so our mission statement is to promote justice and champion value for victims of injustice and those that serve them around the world. Wow. Yeah. So I love that. And I get to do that in a couple of ways. The main way we do that is with Beauty for Ashes Uganda. So we work in Northern Uganda and we have 1,183 single moms and widows in our program. And we get to walk with them to long-term sustainability and deep healing through empowerment projects and mutually transformative relationships that change their lives and that change our lives in the process. (laughs) So I get to do a lot of that. That's about 90% of my job and my days. And then I also get to lead soul care retreats. So we do free retreats for nonprofit leaders to pour into them like they pour into people around the world. So that, as far as our mission statement goes, that's the, and those that serve them around the world part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) And so we get to pour into people who are doing hard and holy work around the world and fighting injustices like human trafficking, global poverty, and domestic violence, homelessness, et cetera. And then really my passion is for healing, Mm -hmm. for freedom and for healing that we might know our belovedness and that we might experience really deep healing. So sort of on the side, I get to walk a lot with people who are healing, mostly women who are healing from sexual violence, and just other things. And so I feel like that's that's who I am or who I want to be in this world. 
is a voice that is calling out to others so that they would know their belovedness and they would know that freedom and healing are a thing and they really are possible and that I would call to the church to come and to stand with the marginalized and with the broken because it is here that we see the face of God. I love it. Oh my gosh. There's, there's so much we can go into. Right. Uh, I <laughs> we can talk for like 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Which you know, We promise we won't though, listeners. We yeah, promise. <laughs> we promise. That'd be tough. We, we break it into separate episodes for sure. Right. Everybody's checking right now their little <laughs> app. Like, wait, how long is this? <laughs> right. okay, cool. Only 30 minutes. We're good. We're good. So yeah, <laughs> I'd, I'd love to, um, I'd love to really kind of go back to your start childhood upbringing because so much of what you do, you know, I'd imagine there are different points where you can connect back to and say, you know, I remember this moment that led me to want to do work in Uganda. I remember this moment that showed me the power of healing. And so I want to start with just some of those, you know, maybe those milestone markers that you can think of from your childhood that you look back at and say, I am the person that I am because of, yeah. you know, these things that happen. Yeah. I've actually thought through that a lot. And I think it's so fun to go back and to recognize the things that really made a difference and that played a part in shaping each of us. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. For me, a huge part of it, and this is going to, Sounds like is reading. Huh. So when I was little, I loved to read. Like had a book everywhere I went, reading in the car. We would take long trips because my dad traveled for work and we would go along with him when we were homeschooled off and on. And so I would read a ton. And I really wanted to read Nancy Drew books. Okay. <laughs> so I loved a good mystery. And my parents had a rule. So their rule was for every Nancy Drew book, I had to read a missionary biography. Huh. So it's really fascinating. No, no. We we went to a pretty missions-minded church. And I think they just didn't want me to only read Nancy Drew. Like, come on. Expand your horizon a little bit, Bran. (laughs) And they... And so like even asking them now, they're like, I don't even know why we came up with that plan. We just did. (laughs) And so from the time I was probably four to five, I would tell people I wanted to be a missionary in Africa. Mm. And so I think this had a lot to do with, I had Sunday school teachers and I was really little that had been missionaries to Africa and they would tell us their stories and show pictures. And so you know, other little girls dream of like castles and white picket fences. And I dreamed of mud huts and patched roofs. (laughs) And so in so many ways, I am living all of my childhood dreams. Now there will be days in Uganda where it is like dusk and the mango trees are all around and the mud huts and the thatched roofs. And there's a group of mamas drumming in this set of the field and I just get overwhelmed. Like this is what dreams are made of. Yeah. And so then I started to read and I would read all of these books and I love it because I think both are really a part of me still. Like I still love mystery. I love adventure. I don't have a lot of fears. I mean, I've been overseas and gone with friends who were doing undercover work in brothels and I'm just, Like, I love, I don't mind adventure. And I really, when doing healing work and when talking about freedom, one of the keys is for us to be detectives of our own soul. Hmm. To really find out, why do I do this? Where did this start? What lie am I believing that the enemy has tried to give me? And and in some ways, I have to be Nancy Drew for that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So I have to be the detective part. And then I began to read these missionary books and I just fell in love with a new country every time I read a book. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, no, that's where I want to go. No, that's where I want to go. And I remember especially reading about George Mueller, Mm -hmm. who was a missionary. I don't really know when, like way back when, 1800s maybe. Okay. 
Back and then. yeah, back in the day. And he had like an orphanage, I think. And he would sit the kids down. He never fundraised, which is amazing. And obviously I haven't followed his footsteps in that because people <laughs> tease that my spiritual gifting is fundraising. I feel like it's all I do. <laughs> um, but he had great faith. And there were times when there was not a piece of bread in their pantry and they would sit the kids down at the table and he would lead the kids in praying and saying, thank you to God for their meal. That wasn't, they didn't have. And somebody would knock on their door with food. And I remember thinking that's who I want to be in this world. Mm. Like I want to have that kind of faith. Um, now I'm kicking myself for that sometimes because that kind of faith is really scary. And the times I have a thousand kids who need to go to school and we don't have all the money raised for school fees. Um, those are terrifying times. And I really swing between God's got this. Oh my gosh. I'm going to be like George Mueller, like faith, faith, faith. And like wanting to crawl into the table and cry. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nobody prepared me for the really, really scary part and the hard parts of the faith journey. But I knew from a young age that I wanted to do that. And then I would say that the other thing that really prepared me is my parents. Mm. My parents love well and they love big. Mm. So gift giving is my parents' love language. Really my dad's and I think my mom has kind of entered into it. And they love to give big, extravagant gifts to people they don't even know. Like, if if you're shopping with them and my dad finds out you, like, would really like to have an Apple Watch and you don't, like, he wants to bring you and buy you one. (laughs) It's it's so precious. And it just, people feel so loved by that. And so I think that has, in a lot of ways, shaped how I view how we need to love people that I really have a passion for loving people well and loving them deeply, but loving them extravagantly because I believe that's how we are loved is really just wildly extravagant. And so I want to love my mamas in Uganda just extravagantly with everything within me and our soul care girls, my sisters, nonprofit leaders who come to retreats, we want to love them extravagantly. We have a massage therapist who comes and gives them free massages and a photographer and we collect presents from around the world and we take these girls to the Ritz Carlton because yeah. like, it's not just that you're loved kind of, it's that you are wildly, deeply, extravagantly loved. Mm. And how do we do that in a broken world is really my big question that I'm trying yeah. to answer with my life. Yeah. I, I love that. And I think there's, there's so much power to the, the things that we experience growing up and how those ultimately shape the different places where mm-hmm. we choose to walk into. And I think that, you know, it's, it's very, it's very plain to see, uh, especially from my perspective, yeah. you know, seeing that, yeah. You know, seeing that early desire of, you know, I want to, yeah. I want to go to Africa. I don't even know what Africa looks like, but I want to go. Um, you yeah. Know, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, just from that, from the love that you've seen from your parents. And I, I think that for me, that speaks to something that I heard you talk about when we went to Uganda together, which is really this idea of mutually transformative relationships. And Brandy, would you mind Mm -hmm. kind of going deeper into what that actually means? Because I know that it's been something for me that has completely like changed my perspective on how I serve and how I give of myself and how I, you know, own and be present in this life that we're in. So Brandy, would you mind just about mutually transformative relationships? Yeah, definitely. It's because it's transformed me as well as we've been learning. And a lot of it really comes, um, number one, I think it comes back for me learning it in my own brokenness. Mm -hmm. And so when I went through a divorce in 2010 and, and some really deep brokenness, what it meant to have people stand alongside me and not just like help me and not just love me even though 
kind of a thing. And I began to learn that what we call love may not actually feel like love to everyone. Mm. And so that made me take a bit of a step back. And, and I went through kind of a transformation in my faith there. And I read a lot of Henry Nowen, who's like my dead author crush. Okay. So like everybody else loves C.S. Lewis. Henry Nowen is my dead author crush. Like I'm obsessed with this man. He's and awesome. yeah. And he talks about how compassion needs to be two people that are walking alongside each other, not just one person serving the other. Yeah. Because wow. anytime we have hierarchy, people can feel that. Yeah. We might not think that they can, and we might not be trying to do that, but people can feel that. And if we truly recognize the beloved in each person, then each person has something to teach us and we might have something to give them. And so if we go around life thinking that I'm going to save people with it, or I'm going to change people, or I'm going to heal people, or I'm going to whatever it is, that's about me doing for them. Yeah. And that's not a with mentality. It's a for mentality. Mm. And that has the, uh, the imagery even of above and below. I'm doing this for you. Instead of I'm doing this with you and side by side. And so we really believe in mutually transformative relationships. Yeah. And that, that mainly we talk about it in terms of our mamas in Uganda and how we are not here to be the great white savior who's coming in to save the day. We are here to walk with these women because they teach us as much as we teach them. Mm-hmm. And they may be a different set of lessons but all of them are so valuable and we've seen it. I mean, my advocates who take a village and they want to use their voice to find sponsors for these mamas, all of them would say that their lives have been changed way more than the lives of the mamas in their village. Like they are transformed in this process, but I believe it extends beyond like our humanitarian work and that uh, having and taking a position of mutually transformative relationships is seeing nobody as above or below you. Mm. And so that works when we are, you know, a wildlife leader or a young life leader that works when somebody comes to my house and they've been struggling. I have a lot of people, a lot of people kind of just show up at my house crying (laughs) I mean, it really is true. Uh, crying or people across the world who reach out to me and say, like, I know that you've known brokenness and you know healing. Will you walk with me? Wow. And so instead of being a teacher or a healer, what I want to be is a fellow sojourner mm-hmm. that I can say, I can stand here at your tomb with you because I have experienced resurrection. Yeah. So my favorite story in the Bible is Lazarus. Hmm. Because, I mean, hello, water to wine sounds great, but the dead come to life, like, that's my jam. Yeah. (laughs) Right? And so I, and I believe, like, I've experienced resurrection. I have experienced brokenness turned to healing and the dead come to life. And because I know that in my own story, I can more freely stand there with others in theirs. Mm -hmm. And then they become mutually transformative. Wow. Because I'm not trying to change their life. We are both just being changed. Yeah, yeah. It also takes the pressure off. Like when we don't think we have to be transformative in the world, yeah. we believe that we experience people who will transform us and vice versa, then it takes the pressure off. Like I can just be a fellow sojourner. I love that. And I think that that is something that I clearly saw through Beauty for Ashes Uganda when we were there just a few months back. And I think that, you know, there's, there's definitely that. And I think it comes with, you know, a sense of privilege as, you know, sort of this Mm -hmm. added on responsibility that we give ourselves of we're here to serve and we're here to, you know, make a difference. And I think there's a place Mm -hmm. for that, but I think the beauty of what you're talking about is it's also a posture of receiving a posture of learning a posture of saying, Mm -hmm. I don't know, 
And, you know, I don't necessarily yeah. need to know, like I get to learn here. Yeah. And I'd love to just pivot into what are some of the things that for the mamas in Uganda that you're working with, what are the types of things that you see them going through on, you know, mm. a, a daily basis, sort of some of the, some of the issues yeah, big and small that they're facing that you guys are having to walk with them in? Yeah. So we work in Northern Uganda or what's considered Northern Uganda. It's a little bit central, but they consider it Northern Uganda because that is where Joseph Kony came through. So if anyone is familiar with the Invisible Children, the organization and the movie, um, or Child Soldiers, or has watched a Machine Gun Preacher. Yeah. So that force that Joseph Coney and the LRA came through our villages in 2003. And it was actually the third rebel group to come in in 25 years. Wow. So we are walking in a space that now they've been safe, quote unquote, for... 14 years now, but we are still dealing with the effects. And so um, with 1200 moms in your program, right? We deal with a lot of different things, yeah. but a lot of it is still healing from years and years of rebel activity. Yeah. And so I've got mamas who had their children kidnapped and they haven't seen them since I have moms. Um, we have a couple married women in our program and one of them because her husband his eyes were gouged out by the LRA. Oof. And so he is blind and can't work. And so she really lives almost as a widow because she has to um, help the family. And, mm -hmm. and our moms, we focus on single moms. And a single mom in Uganda is a woman who's never been married. And so a good percentage of our moms gave birth to their first child before the age of 15. Wow. So they're treated a lot like, like teen moms would be here. Like, yeah. I can't believe you let that happen to you. Yeah. I mean, we've seen the struggle um, of how teen moms in America are treated. And so our moms have experienced that. Mm -hmm. They've been kicked out of their homes, kicked out of their churches, even if a lot, some, a lot of the time I would say that their pregnancies were not of their own volition, mm -hmm. uh, that they are being taken advantage of, even sometimes when they didn't even recognize it necessarily as a violation. And so... I would say that our moms are still healing from rebel activity. They're still healing from abuse and abandonment, um, being kicked aside, sexual violence, uh, what they call common violence against the poor. That's what Gary Haugen of IJM calls it in his book, The Locust Effect, okay. which is about the fact that they don't have a lot of resources, so they're more apt to be taken advantage of yeah. just in everyday life. Um, our moms, most of them cannot read. A good portion of them have never been to school a day in their life. So not even elementary school, which is extremely sad because primary school, elementary school is actually free in Uganda. <laughs> you just have to pay like a registration fee. Yeah. And so, but many of them weren't sent to school because their dad said, what's the use of educating a girl? Wow. Like you need to stay home. You need to take care of their, your family. If you can't read and write, then you're going to be taken advantage of. If you don't know math, yeah. you're going to be taken advantage of at the market, which is an, ag an agrarian society where you're growing and selling what you grow. Yeah. Especially with the currency, like it's, you know, right now it's about 3,500 shillings to a dollar. And so your numbers are really big when you're selling even, yeah. you know, a bucket full of maize of corn. Yeah. Wow. Your numbers are big. And so if you don't know how to count, you're dealing with that. And so our mamas are living in abject poverty. The UN declares you living under the poverty line if you live on less than two US dollars a day per person. You're considered under extreme poverty if you live on less than a dollar twenty-five. When we did our baseline survey in 2014, our mamas were living on less than 76 cents a day for their entire families. Wow. And so we were really dealing with serious issues of hunger and malnutrition and mamas with brand new babies who were not eating because they were trying to save money for their kids' school, but then their milk was drying up for their new babies. Mm. And so we've made um, a lot of progress. 
we really believe in empowerment. Our moms are brilliant and resilient and strong, but the truth is you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds simple, but we, we forget that. We think that people are dumb because they're not doing one thing or the other. But the truth is that you don't know what you don't know. We have moms. Uh, we just started what we call our literacy plus. So they're learning. Mo- the mamas call it going to school. They're like, thank you so much for t- sending us back to school because so many of them have never had that chance a day in their lives. And so they're going three days a week for reading, writing, basic math, sanitation, hygiene, nutrition, agriculture, anything they can teach that is real life relevant to their lives. And they'll say things like, well, nobody ever told me I had to have a rack for my dishes. I didn't know that putting my dishes on the ground is what was giving us disease in our family. Wow. I didn't know I couldn't keep the goats in the same bedroom as us. Yeah. And that their feces would affect us because you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And so we're seeing these precious mamas lives just transformed just by knowledge. Yeah. And so when you know better, you do better. And so they are building themselves, you know, dish racks and um, tip taps, which are like basically little washing, hand washing stations outside of their latrines and pit latrines. And they're, you know, standing up for themselves in the market. My favorite story recently was a mama who said, I used to be taken advantage of all the time, but recently I was in the market and this man tried to give me back change, which in the past she had just held out her hand with her money and the person would take whatever they expected, which, so we can imagine how well that went. Yeah. yeah. Um, (laughs) Right. Like, um, that's not, it is not going well. And a man tried to cheat her. And she was like, ah, yeah, no, no, sorry. I actually know how to count. Yeah, I love it. Which I know, I like cheered for the mama. And then what I told her is I said, not only am I thrilled for you that you know math, I'm even more thrilled that you knew you were worth standing up for. Wow. And that's why we have to combine sustainable development with deep healing. And so our mantra, which you heard ad nauseum in Uganda when you were with us this summer. Uh, but is you are loved and you are worth loving. Yeah. And so we want the mamas to know that you're loved and not just because like we're good. And so we'll love you anyways. Yeah. No, you are loved because you are worth loving. Who you are is worth celebrating and worth loving. You are easy to love because we see beauty in you. Yeah. And they're starting to get it. They're starting to believe um, that they are worthy. I remember uh, this earlier last year. I don't even remember when it is or which trip, but I was sitting with this group from a Moru village and 12 of the moms had never been to school of 30. We put women in women's cooperatives. Okay. So that's 30 mamas who meet together weekly to encourage and empower each other and to pool their own resources so that they can take loans from each other. Yeah. And so we have 38 of those women's cooperatives. And so I was sitting with the mamas from Amoru and 12 of the 30 had never been to school a day in their lives. And wow. I, I started to hear the stories of why, and I started to tear up and I said to the mamas, you know, I'm thrilled for you guys to learn to read and write. Like seeing you guys write your name for the first time is just a holy, like I will cry every, Every single time seeing a 65 year old woman write her name for the first time is just yeah. uh, so precious. Uh, I said, but what I want more than anything is I want you to know that you are seen mm. and that when somebody didn't put you to, in school, when you were a kid, those dreams you had of learning to read because, you know, they actually dream of going to school. Not like my kids here in America who dream of like not going to school yeah. in Uganda, <laughs> they dream of going to school. And those dreams that you had, it wasn't okay that people didn't see you. And I want you to know that I really believe that God's heart broke when they didn't see you and when they chose to make you a slave instead of a daughter. And when you were fed less and you weren't put in school. And I want you to know now that you are seen and that we're so sorry. We, there's nothing special about us. We are just finally the first people who said yes. 
because I really do believe that all along their lives, God was calling people to see them and people just weren't. They were choosing yeah. to look the other way. Wow. And so there, there's nothing special about us. We just finally were like, yeah, yeah, we'll totally see them. <laughs> They're yeah. amazing. And I said, that's what I want you to know. And so I want every day you go to literacy for it to be healing to the deep places in your soul that began to believe you were unseen. Wow. And so that's really what I hope is that with every movement of empowerment, with every... Right now we're raising money for Christmas gifts and so they're getting new animals and crops and training for their group businesses. But I pray that those won't just be goats, that they will be examples and evidence to them that they are seen and that they are worth being seen and that they are worth loving. Mm, That's powerful. I think we hear, you know, we hear those that phrasing a lot, you know, you were seen, you were known, you were loved. And I think it's easy to, you know, just overlook that, you know, mm-hmm. to think that those words don't necessarily hold a significant amount of power, but I think it's so clear to see, even as you were talking mm-hmm. that, you know, those are deep, deep desires that, you know, all of us have to, you know, to be seen, to be known, yeah. to be loved. And, when we have those experiences where we are finally beginning to grasp that and we, you know, we may spend our whole lives trying to just yeah. grasp those three simple truths, but yeah, those things can be so transformative. And I, I just, I love that. They really can. And Brandy, so much of what you're talking about, it's, it's, inspiring it's empowering it's motivating it's all these things and at the same time I you know I don't have to imagine this because I I know it's true for you I know that these these things can weigh heavy I know that they (laughs) they result in in tears more times than not that you know Mm -hmm. there are deep deep difficulties that come with these things and so Mm -hmm. more so wanted to ask you and hopefully this can be something that's valuable for those listening as well but in those in those moments of pain in those moments that as I've heard you talk about can produce secondary trauma Mm -hmm. um, what are what have been things or words or stories that have helped you care for your soul in the midst of this in the midst of this deep incredible work oh yeah man we could talk about this for 30 minutes in and of itself uh, I am actually really just now grasping that I'm just now mm-hmm. grasping secondary trauma I've been doing this now for about 10 years and um, kind of when you combine the stories that I've heard in Uganda from the stories that I hold on a daily basis yeah. from people here around the country um, it's had a really profound impact on me And I'm recognizing that secondary trauma and even PTSD from secondary trauma are a real thing. And so um, I'm sort of in the process of doing some healing work. And I'm actually taking a little bit of a a step back. I asked my board of directors if I could do kind of the bare minimum for the rest of the year and do some healing work. Because I believe that we create what we are, Mm. right? And so we've all heard the, you know, hurt people, hurt people, broken people, break people. Yeah. But the truth is that that's not the end of the story. Mm-hmm. Yes, hurt people, hurt people, but whole people are a part of healing people yeah. and freed people, free people and loved people, love people. And so it is up to each of us to decide kind of where we are in that and who we want to be. And so when I have came to terms really over the last, I just did a retreat for nonprofit leaders on secondary trauma, which meant I had to learn about secondary trauma if I was going to teach a retreat on it. And so I did all of this studying (laughs) and like saw myself in these books. I felt like I was reading my own mail. Mm. So they say, and so I'm recognizing like, okay, so I can't lead out of this place of woundedness. I have to take a step back and kind of what that means 
is that it's begun to affect my worldview, huh. right? So I go into a room and I think that almost every woman in that room has been the victim of sexual violence. Yeah. Or I remember looking around a, a room in, in an airport, uh, crown, the Delta Crown Club, and thinking, like, I wonder how many of these men have violated women. And I went, ah, that's not normal. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I need to take a step back and I need to focus on the good and the beautiful and the holy in this world. And I need to take some time to process. And so one of my friends who works in El Salvador, her name's Danielle Snyder. She runs Mission to El Salvador, which is a phenomenal organization. But she lives in a very, very dangerous city. So she sees things all the time. And her therapist told her that every day she needed to take time to grieve. Mm. And how we hold grief and loss determines our entire lives. Yeah. And so I... One of the things I'm learning to do, and I, I say learning because I'm not an expert at this yet, is that when I do hold space for a story, that I take time to grieve it, mm. that that was not okay when that, that happened to that person. And, and I'm going to grieve that I had, that they had to live that and that I had to carry that and enter that space and that that even is a thing in this world yeah. and that I need to take time to just be present in that pain for a moment. And for me, because I come from a, a faith background. I, you know, struggle with saying I'm a Christian, but I love Jesus. So that's a whole other deal. Um, I need to recognize that Jesus is holding my tears too. Wow. And that he wept for them, but also that he has them. And so that I can walk with them for a portion, but that I don't have to carry it for the rest of my life. And so a lot of times I think we leave our energy or our soul in the stories of the people that we walk with and we need to kind of take it back mm. and to be like, yes, I mourn with you. I grieve with you. I sit with you. And, and then I'm going to leave you here for your healing because your healing is, is between you and your soul and your God. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm learning how to do that, how to, kind of take my soul back a little bit. I'm also learning how to maybe set better boundaries and not work until midnight every night. <laughs> um, and then I think the biggest key is choosing to see the joy. Mm. And so there's this, um, there's this idea that, you know, once you get a certain car, you see that car everywhere, right? Yeah. So I drive a blue Honda Pilot. I notice blue Honda Pilots. Because you, your eyes see what you're looking for. I'm not sure if we're allowed to curse on this, but I, there's a phrase that says, you look for evidence to prove your own bullshit theory. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're always looking for evidence to prove our theories. And you can edit that out if you need to. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I love it. <laughs> okay, so what I recognize is that I, as I'm driving down the road, I notice all the blue Honda Pilots. And so if I'm walking and suffering, I notice all the suffering in the world. And what I need to do is not ignore the blue Honda pilots. I need to just recognize that there are other cars on the road too. Yeah. Wow. Right. And yeah. so to take in so that I can fully integrate everything else into my life. And so I need to recognize that yes, there is suffering, but I'm also going to pay attention intentionally to joy, to play, to the good stories and the hope. I know you've had Brandon Harvey, who is a mutual friend of both of ours, yeah, but yeah. following the Good Good Co. on Instagram and on Facebook and getting their newsletters to recognize that there is good in this world. And, you know, I talked about being at the tomb and there is a lot of death, right, at the tomb. Yeah. There's a lot of brokenness, but it is where the dead come to life. And so I need to be just as diligent about celebrating the life as I am about mourning the death. Wow. And when I can do that, I live a more fully integrated life and a wholer life. And yeah. so I'm really paying attention to that in this season. Like, let's, I want to hear all of the good. My staff in Uganda are sending me the amazing stories that are happening on the ground and the mamas that are changing their lives and are sending their kids to school and planting orange trees and knowing their value. And, and I'm paying more careful attention to that. And then I'm playing a lot more. Mm -hmm. So like I will throw costume parties and I will play games 
because play is a really important part that we sometimes miss out as adults. Yeah. Absolutely. And we forget how important that is. Okay. So, and I think, I think we have to do both. And too often in this world, we pick one side or the other, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm going to be all about joy and I'm going to ignore the sufferings. Mm-hmm. I don't want anybody to hear me and to think like, well, then I'm not going to do that kind of work. She sounds jacked up. <laughs> like, who wants to live her life? Um, and I hope that that's not what listeners feel because I don't think we need to go to the side that says just play, just joy, just all of that. But I also think we don't need to go to the side that says just suffering. Yeah. And that if we lived in a, fu- a fully integrated life, we would recognize the both and. I think my next tattoo is actually going to be the ampersand, the okay. and symbol. Yeah. Because that is so true. And we need to hold space that this world, our lives are a place where we hold space for both grief and gratitude. Mm. Because we live in a world that is not as it should be, right? Like we, nobody doubts that there is suffering, but there is also joy. And we cannot, if we want to live wholeheartedly, like Brene Brown says, if we want to live wholeheartedly, we cannot ignore either but we must enter both with an awareness of the other. Wow. Yeah. Gosh, Brandy, (laughs) so much goodness (laughs) over here, like mentally just jotting down notes because I mean, so much of what you're saying is true and necessary and easily, I think can be easily missed if we don't take time to focus on it. So Brandy, as we, before we move on to the final two questions, I just want to take a few seconds to honor you and kind of less outside of the realm of the amazing things that you're doing in the world that can be publicly viewed and all that. But, you know, I've had a, I've gotten you know, to see a different view of being in your house and getting to spend time with your kids and hang out with you and see that there is a, there's a deep love and a deep commitment there. And Mm. I I think it's perfect that we are kind of making this pivot after, after talking about what you just talked about, because I, one of my, one of the things that I admire about you most is how you fully engage life. And I think that's, you know, what, what Jesus talks about when he talks about, you know, I want to, I want to give you a full life Mm -hmm. that doesn't just abundance. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't just mean the, the good that doesn't just mean the doesn't even just mean all the bad. It's, it's all of it. You know, there's a time for Mm -hmm. each of these things. And so Brandy, I just want to honor you and thank you for how you, how you allow that example to be seen for so many and how you show that to your kids each day. And I'm, I'm grateful to be, uh, grateful to be one of those kids, even if not blood related. <laughs> yes. I am proud to be your Colorado Springs mama. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Well, Brandy. Yeah, um, thank you. Absolutely. And first question of these final two is really one of what is giving you life right now? Mm. You know, what is something that is making you feel more alive, you know, making you feel ready to take on the day, whatever that may be for you? Okay, I'll give you a silly answer and a serious answer. Okay. Uh, Serious answer are podcasts. Mm. Being, I am listening to some profound, I'm listening to every podcast I can find with Richard Rohr on it. Yes. He's a theologian. He is just brilliant. And then yesterday I listened to this podcast. It was on the Rob Bell podcast Mm. with this guy named Alexander Shia, Shia maybe, and talking about why Christians chose December 25th and how it connected with the Celtic holiday of winter solstice and the darkest day um, on earth being December 22nd. And then so we set Christmas as three days later. Three yeah. days after the deepest dark is when the sun is seen for the first time. Wow. And so that's when we put, and it just, things like that, that blow my mind yeah. feel really life-giving because I'm learning and I'm growing and I love the power of words. And so d- great quotes are like my bread and butter. 
Um, and because play is so important. Okay, so here's the really silly thing that's saving my life right now. Um, second day updates on the radio. Yes. So I listen to John Jan Rich and Brooke and Jubal in the mornings. And they have people call in with these horrible, horrific first dates. And then they call the other person to see like their side of the story and see if they want to go out on a second date. And they have me rolling every morning. Like I am just dying. I call my boyfriend and I'm like, oh my gosh, did you hear the second date update this morning? And so just ridiculousness and remembering that that's kind of a part of the world. And it makes me giggle first thing in the morning, which I love. Like I love to laugh. And so having that be a part of, you know, my 8 a.m. drive is kind of like, you know, saving my life right now. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Those, yeah, those things are always hilarious. I've heard ones where it's like, gosh, there's, you know, so many of the like prank call ones that are out there. Yeah. Mm. Like radio, if you're not, if you're not listening to it, it's, it's, it's where you need to be. Well, maybe because it's also can be very like inappropriate. So I'm not like giving my like full endorsement to this. Like you do what you need to do, boo boo. <laughs> but for me, it's pretty darn. Funny. I, I do have to like have my hand there if my kids are in the car. Like I may have to change the yeah. station because sometimes those are like oh 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 crossing the line. I have middle schoolers. <laughs> <laughs> well, Randy, I'm sure after after this conversation, there are going to be people who want to continue to follow along with your story. Who are going to want to yeah. learn more about Beauty for Ashes and soul care workshops that you're doing and all the things. And so where can people go to follow along with you and the different things that you're involved with? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, Okay. So me personally, I'm on Instagram and Facebook as Brandy Lee, B-R-E-N-D-I-L-E-A. You can find me on either of those. And I am pretty vulnerable, (laughs) authentic. You really will get a behind the scenes. What you see is really what you get. Um, And so that's me. And then for Beauty for Ashes, you can go to www.beautyforashesworldwide.org. And then you can find links from there to Soul Care and to Beauty for Ashes Uganda. And if you really want to get involved in Uganda, you can also follow Beauty for Ashes Uganda on Facebook. Remember the Uganda part because just a hint, we didn't make up the Beauty for Ashes part. That's (laughs) in the Bible. So lots of organizations called Beauty for Ashes. Um, but if you search Beauty for Ashes Uganda on Facebook, you'll find us. We're super active there. You'll see lots of pictures of mamas. And if you want to sponsor a mama, it's $23 a month. And you can click Sponsor a Mama right there on our website. And I, I'm just saying, because if you're finding out from this, if you sponsor a mama, you should choose the village of Chele, C-H-E-E-L-E, because that's Alex's village. <laughs> yes. How awesome would it be if everybody <laughs> who's listening to this episode right now goes and for $23 a month sponsors a mama. And, you know, just to think about so many things that Brandy talked about, you know, these are, these are the types of, these are the types of things that we get to be a part of when we choose to commit to that. So Brandy, yeah. thank you so much for, coming on today and chatting with me and I look forward to being together in person again soon. Yes. Thank you so much. I have so enjoyed it and I hope all of your listeners know that they are absolutely loved and completely and utterly worth loving today. Today's episode was produced by me, Alex Lewis, and our awesome music was provided by Julius Tunstall. Check him out on Instagram at jtulius. That's J-T-U-L-I-U-S. If you enjoyed today's episode, I encourage you to leave a five-star rating and review on your Apple Podcast app. That's a major way more people can learn about the show and be impacted by these conversations. And I also encourage you to take a screenshot of you listening to this podcast and share it on your Instagram story. Together, let's prove that encouraging words and small acts of love can make a big difference in the lives of those around us. Until next time, you matter you are enough. Remember these words when times get tough.